so yeah welcome uh, everyone and there will be people joining uh, as and when they are free from there uh, and, uh, so we have today a very important figure in philosophy of uh, mind professor david papina who is a formidable name in consciousness research and many other uh, allied uh, areas now this program has invited many luminaries and leaders of thought leaders from across the domains philosophy of mind and cognitive science and neuroscience and other fields and we have been doing it taking advantage of covid we started before it but i think the virtual the virtual platform has come handy and uh, we have had the chance to talk to many of these leaders and this is one way to also increase uh, thinking and the sharing of information that uh, many students who are watching and other uh, faculty from india the benefit so today is uh, uh, as all of us would agree that philosophical thinking drives empirical research you know the way around i mean this might might take at least in mind brain sciences so a uh, philosophy of mind has had a lot of things to eliminate uh, and uh, we will talk about it uh, you know in connection to materialism and digitalism that professor that you know is known for so his work uh, transcends um, both metaphysics of mind as well as more empirical aspects of um, you know, neuroscience as we know and he has had taught in many universities uh, he has a, he has a joint appointments in, in king's college london and also new york university and uh, um, did his phd from cambridge he taught there in cambridge for many years so right now he is in king's college and he has written many important books i cannot name all of that books on consciousness books on philosophy of science because he had a background of philosophy of science early on that he moved to consciousness that he has stayed on and more recently my interest in his work and many many other philosophers of mind is obviously i dabble with the question of empiricism and philosophical questions or the interpretation interpretation of data so where are we i was watching a, a, a talk a couple of days ago with philip goff professor papino and kit thankus and as you would know that many 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 such people uh, that are slightly young that are turning turning mentalist or they 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 want to accept the mind and the invisibility and the mystery of it and they want to disregard or at least you know not take empirical brain science seriously Uh, philip goff is one of them i mean i have read his written book and it might come up but professor papino was his supervisor so he knows his ways out and it was a very interesting talk i would recommend all the audience to have to, to look at it nevertheless so we have a legend here and we would like to know from him what is his take on the question of the mind uh, and what we can learn from it so uh, with this i welcome uh, david uh, that you kindly accepted uh, the invitation and uh, you uh giving your time and we look forward to the interaction and we are a university uh, that is a high profile research university in india and uh, we uh, want to uh, internationalize our activities and we keep inviting many scholars and our students to visiting so uh, the indian in indian in indian context mind brain sciences have had a very uh, you know i would say a very uh, little uh, past it has not been very old unlike other countries so we have Uh, been doing it and more needs to be done in multiple areas so this is one way to encourage younger students to think beyond uh, uh, the courses they are taking or uh, the research they are doing so this is one way to motivate them and you will see many questions might come from from that point of view okay. if not outright uh, densely philosophical so anyway i am very thankful and uh, we look forward to your presentation then we'll take it up from there so now the floor is yours thank you thank you very much ramesh thank you for the introduction and thank you uh to you and your colleagues uh and uh vaishnavi who i've been uh, corresponding with for inviting me and uh now i so i'll talk for not more than 25 minutes and we can have a discussion and i've got some slides so let me try and share my screen now does this now what can you see I'm screen sharing but I haven't started the slide show yet so if I start the slide show you can all see my slides yes perfectly fine 
That's good. All right. That's very good. So th th this is my little talk. The mind is just the brain. And those of you who looked at the abstract will know that uh, what I'm planning to do is I'm going to present you with a simple logical argument that I think has persuaded most scientists and uh, most philosophers. Ramesh said, look, there's some, there's some backsliders uh, at the moment, but uh, uh, of the materialist view that, that uh, the mind, nothing more than the brain. So I'm going to explain the argument. I'm going to show that its emergence is due to scientific developments, not just intellectual fashion. And I'm going to finally address the hard problem of consciousness and argue that it replies, it, it provides no reason to reject materialism. So here's the simple logical argument. Uh, that's my book about 20 years ago about, about consciousness and uh the arguments uh spelt out in there I mean, it's not original to me I, I i take this just to be a, a kind of uh distillation of what many people have been thinking over the last 50 years or more so here's here's three premises uh mental states uh have physical effects uh i'm not thinking just about conscious mental states but i'm thinking about them into alias. So if you're interested, especially in consciousness, think about this is applying to conscious mental, mental states. And our mental states have physical effects. You feel a pain, you feel sad, you, uh, you visually experience something that leads you to move your body in various ways and uh, your movements of your body will have further physical effects. So, so mental states do have physical effects. But at the same time, we've got reason to think that all physical effects have fully physical causes. I mean, think about movement of my body, movement of my arm, because perhaps I decide to raise my arm, that's a mental state, I raise my arm, that's a physical effect. Uh, now think of it from a, the point of view of a physiologist. I mean, why did my arm go up? Well, because uh, muscles contracted, because there was activity in the motor cortex, because there was before that activity in the prefrontal cortex. So the physiologist would expect to be able to explain the physical effect, the movement of my arm, entirely uh, from a physical point of view. They wouldn't expect to have to leave the physical realm to find causes for the sequence of events that, that followed. Okay, so now we have an interesting situation. We, we had this physical effect, my arm going up, and it seems to have, by premise one, a mental cause, and by premise two, uh, physical physiological cause so does it have two different causes i mean sometimes things have two separate causes some poor chap is is shot and struck by lightning at the same time he's kind of killed twice over uh, sometimes effects are overdetermined but that seems the wrong model here when we have overdetermination we say look well the result would have happened the man would have died even if he hadn't been shot because he was struck by lightning and vice versa but but do we want to say my arm would still have gone up even if I hadn't decided to raise it because of the activity in the motor cortex, or do we want to say, you know, it would still have gone up uh, even if there hadn't been any activity in the motor cortex, because I just, that, that's what you'd say if there were two separate causes, but that doesn't look like the right model here. So premise three is that the physical effects aren't always overdetermined by two different causes. So if, if you accept those three premises, you're pretty much driven to the conclusion that the, the mental states that we thought of in the first place, the pains, the sensations, the decisions that uh, uh, produce the movements of our body are one and the same as the, the uh, physiological causes, the activity in the motor cortex uh, that uh, gave rise to the movement of my arm. I mean, think of it like this. Uh, uh, premise one says, uh, the movements of our body have mental causes. Premise two says they have physical causes. Premise three says they don't have two separate causes. Uh, what's the conclusion? The, the mental causes mentioned in one and the physical causes mentioned in two must be the same thing. So that's the argument. Uh, oh, what's happened? Oh, here we are. That's all right. Uh, so here's... Uh, we, 
we might not initially think of the mind in physical terms, rather we think of it in terms of beliefs and desires and pains and sensations and sensory experiences and so on. But what the above argument on the previous slide uh, indicates is that these concepts in fact refer to physical processes in the brain. They don't refer to anything apart from that. Um, so, so, you know, compare the way that science has shown us that water is just being composed of H2O molecules or that fire is rapid oxidation. Similarly, science has shown us that mental states are just brain processes. And maybe it will show us, I mean, when we look, investigate particular mental states, it, it will show us that uh, uh, pain is uh, C fibers firing seeing something red is a certain neural oscillation in v4 area of the visual cortex so the, the, the suggestion is 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 that science will show us just as that water is h2o that various mental states are just brain processes here's a way of understanding the argument more clearly here are four possible positions on the mind-brain relation. The first three are dualists. They deny physicalism or materialism. They say that the, the mental states are something, something different to extra from the physical states. So can you see my cursor? If I'm moving the cursor, can you see yes. it? Yes, okay. you can see it. So, so here's here's the brain physical states uh, uh, and here are the mental states. So according to epiphenomenalism, the the mental states are something extra to the physical states, uh, but they don't exert any independent influence on the physical realm. They just uh, uh, are produced by the physical brain as puffs of smoke uh, that have no further influence and you might think of epiphenomenalism as the view you'll end up you with if you deny premise one premise one said mental events have physical causes epiphenomenalism says that mental events are are distinct from the physical realm but but uh exert no influence on it uh, uh here's another position over determinationism here's the brain going along again but whenever there's a brain event uh, it's overdetermined by both a prior physiological event and a prior mental event. So uh, uh, activity in my uh, 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 motor cortex is caused both by prior physical activity in uh, my prefrontal cortex and by my mental decision to uh, uh, raise my arm, say, two separate causes. Uh, that's what you'd get if you denied premise three. You'd accept that, that uh, uh, various uh, uh, physical results of brain processes uh, uh, have mental causes as well. Here's another view. Here's a view that you get if you deny premise two. If you, if you say it's not true that all physical results, say the movement of my uh, arm or the activity in the motor cortex has has a prior physical cause maybe it has a mental cause maybe that mental cause is caused by you know, some physical cause i sit on a pin it makes me feel a pain and that's something separate from the physical realm and that now influences uh, uh, the movement of my body i mean that's a standard a standard view uh, and it's what you get so here you deny premise one uh, here you deny premise two premise three i mean here you bring I premise two. But if you accept all the three premises, then you're forced to uh, equate the mental with the physical, and you don't have any problem about all these. Actually, I should have put arrows in here between the, the physical. Uh, so that's the setup. Now, what to say about these different positions? I mean, this is, this is just kind of uh, abst I mean, filling out how the argument works. You might say, look, these first two positions, epiphenomena and overdeterminationism, they're really hard to believe. They're kind of silly posits. I mean, we don't find anywhere else in nature uh, causal setups like this, uh, uh, effects of processes that don't have any effects themselves. We don't find any causal danglers like that anywhere in, 
in nature. Nor do we find kinds of effects, the movements of our body that always have two separate causes. And you might wonder looking at that picture, what, 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 what mechanism arranges for these two separate causes always to be present? So I think we can dismiss these first two positions as kind of just metaphysically uh, 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 unbelievable. And uh, premises one and premises three are just expressions of the implausibility of these metaphysical positions. But premise three, sorry, uh, the third option, interactionism, that's not, that's not an implausible position at all. Uh, so I've said premises, uh, the first two positions are silly, premises one and three are just rejections of this, this silliness. But the third option, interactionism, that's not silly. And indeed, it's had plenty of support in history philosophy from, from Descartes on. And it's premise to the causal closure of the physical that it eliminates interactionism. And I think that's where the interesting action is. Why, why should we be physicalists rather than interactions? And their answer is because we believe the causal closure of the physical. We think that uh, 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 as here, physical effects always have physical causes. And we don't think there are any physical effects that are due to mental causes. We don't think that uh, uh, some separate mental realm comes in and influences the physical, the physical, uh, physical world. Okay, so that's the argument. Now I'm moving on to a bit of history here. Somebody might say, well, look, that looks like a good argument, but but philosophers haven't always been materialists, and we can look at the history. But uh, materialism, as a, as a widespread view, both in philosophy and and in science, I'm going to say to you, is a fairly recent thing. It's the last fifty or a hundred years. Uh, there's uh, Jack Smart, one of the original Australian central state materialists, who put forward what was then uh, uh, a rather radical view that the mind is just the brain in the 1950s. And, and you might say, given it's so recent, you might say, uh, isn't it just a matter of fashion that people are going around being materialists now? Uh, I'm using physicalism, materialism uh, interchangeably. Uh, I mean, I've given you an argument. You might say, if it's such a good argument, why hasn't everybody always been uh, materialist? But it's not so. I mean, people have only been materialist for the last 50 or 100 years. So you might think this is just a matter of, of passing fashion. I think that's the wrong diagnosis. I think the diagnosis, the explanation for why people have become materialist recently, is that premise two, every, every physical effect has a fully physical cause, is something that people have only come to accept relatively recently. And that's why materialism via this argument has come to, come to the fore. So you might wonder why, is that right? That, uh, oh, my slides are jumping around. Where do I want to be? I want to be here. You might say, look, is that right, that the causal closure of the physical, physical effects always have physical causes is a recent thing? You might think that it was, you know, it's built into modern physics. And this is a little bit of biography here. Uh, I kind of became interested in and convinced of physicalism I don't know, 30 years ago. And, and I thought, well, you know, where's the argument? I had, I had colleagues in Cambridge, England, in philosophy, who didn't want to be didn't want to be physicalists in particular my uh, my old colleague Hugh Meller and my my friend Tim Crane they wrote a paper there is no question of physicalism and and they said where's the argument I said look here's here's an argument and I gave them the argument I just gave it and they said well hang on why sh why should we believe the causal closure of the physical and I said well I mean come on it's part of physics isn't it I mean I I kind of went so far as just they didn't have a sufficient physical education but in fact when i they pressed me and they said show me where it's written down in the physics textbooks i realized that it's not it's not really part of physics to insist on the causal closure of the physical and if you think of newtonian physics it's quite liberal in what causes of 
motion of physical effects it allows. I mean, it has, uh, uh, going back to the 17th century, uh, uh, accelerations by impact, but it also has all kinds of disembodied external forces. Newtonian physics has gravity, has electricity, has magnetism, has forces of chemical affinity. And certainly in the 19th and uh, 18th, 19th centuries, it was very happy to posit vital and mental forces. Uh, and you will find in 18th century Newtonians arguing about forces of irritability and sensibility, different kinds of forces that operated specifically in bodies and they thought of as kind of present in the nervous system. And so they, they I mean, if you think of mental here as meaning non-physical, which we may as well, uh, plenty of room within modern physics to allow for uh, the denial of the causal closure of the physical and to allow for interactionism, their, their physical effects that are produced by the operation of mental forces. You might think, well, what about in the 19th century, they, everybody became convinced of the conservation of energy. Isn't that incompatible with, with uh, vital and mental forces? And you'll, you'll sometimes see people nowadays saying you, you've got to believe in physicalism because of the conservation of energy. But that's a mistake. There's no reason why vital mental forces shouldn't respect the conservation of energy. Uh, in, we all have the phrase now nervous energy. Somebody's full of nervous energy. In the 19th century, they meant that literally. They thought there was a nervous force field. And they thought that when you deliberated, you built up the potential energy of the nervous force field. And when the time for action came, you released it into kinetic energy in the form of bodily movements. And so they thought of uh, special mental forces, nervous force fields as, as completely consistent with, with modern physics and respecting the conservation of energy. That, that picture there is a picture of uh, uh, experiments done by a physiologist, 19th century physiologist called uh, Max Rubner, who was, you know, put dogs in calorimeters and made sure that all the energy they took in by, by uh, eating was given out in terms of heat and he did all the sums. And this wasn't to show that uh, everything operated physically. This was to show that assuming that there were vital force fields involved in metabolism, they respected the conservation of energy. So in fact, it's a re relatively recent thing that people have come to dismiss non-physical forces, vital and mental forces, and insist that everything is due to basically the, the, the fundamental forces that we recognize, gravity, electromagnetism, uh, nuclear forces. And, and what's convinced uh, modern thought of this is simply uh, uh, biochemical research, uh, which uh, has progressed uh, enormously uh, over the last 150 years. And much is now understood about the working of of cells about animal plant metabolism and and all the successes have have uh, shown that everything going on in uh, animal and plant bodies can be explained in terms of electrical chemical forces i think i think that, that huxley and hodgkin's uh, demonstration uh, model of the propagation of action potentials played a crucial role in the 1950s and that's the point at which philosophers all became materialists and i think that's that's the story i mean uh, uh, interactionism has now be been dismissed by educated people scientifically educated people but it's not a matter of fashion it's because they've become convinced that every physical effect has a physical cause and therefore if you'd really insisted on on uh, 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 a separate mental realm it would either force you to the silliness of epiphenomenalism or the silliness of overdeterminationism. Uh, you've got to accept that every physical effect has a physical cause. So that's the reason that people have now become materialists. It's not a matter of fashion, it's a matter of scientific advances. And okay, I'm going to stop talking in a minute. Why am I struggling with my slides here? Okay, those of you who've read uh, recent 
philosophy of mind in particular in connection with this issue of physicalism, aka materialism, will know that there, there are some philosophers who say, look, it's not, it's not so simple, especially when it comes to conscious states. They say, we can't just be uh, uh, happy materialists. They say, look, it's not like, it's not like water and H2O. It's not like, uh, what was my other example? Uh, uh, fire and oxidation. Uh, uh, they say, look, when, when scientists come along and say, look, you know, water is just H2O. And you think, well, that's, that's interesting. Uh, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's worth knowing. Or, you know, fire is just fast, rapid uh, oxidation. You think, oh, that's, that's, uh, maybe surprising but uh, that's that's great uh, and when but when somebody comes along and says look your your conscious pain is just your c fibers firing or your your visual experience of a red surface is just a certain kind of oscillation in v4 uh, these philosophers say our reaction is surely very different we don't think oh yes that's very interesting we think oh no how 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 is that possible uh uh, how how is it that that the mere brain processes can can uh, yield these these conscious feelings? Uh, isn't there uh, something to be explained here, an explanatory gap that we have in the case of consciousness that we don't have in my other scientific examples? Isn't there a hard problem involved in explaining how how the the physical brain gives rise to to these conscious conscious feelings. I I'm not not persuaded that there is a, a problem here. And I think is if you're a materialist, a physicalist, you you have two ways of going. You could, I mean, depending on how you understand the problem, you can either reject the problem as as being mis, misguided, as begging the question against physicalism. Or, or uh, understanding the problem somewhat differently, you can declare the problem solved. So here's two ways of looking at this supposed hard problem. If the problem is supposed to be, how do brain states give rise to or generate or yield or cause the conscious states, then I think uh, physicalists like me should reject the problem. We don't think that the, the, the brain gives rise to or causes conscious states. I mean that's dualist talk. I mean, look, uh, uh, fire fire gives gives rise to smoke. One thing causes another, but that's not our model. We think uh, we think the pains, the the uh, red experiences, just are the brain states. We don't think the brain states give rise to to uh, the the conscious feelings. We think the the brain states are the conscious feelings. So we should, reject, we should reject that way of putting the problem. I mean, of course, if you think in those dualist terms, uh, uh, you, you have a lot of things to explain. I mean, why does the extra conscious feelings, these extra things arise? Uh, when do they arise? What difference do they make to anything? But those are all problems, explanatory problems you have if you're thinking in dualist terms. If you're thinking in physicalist terms, well, there, there, there is a question you might ask, what are conscious states? Not, not how do brains give rise to them, but what are they? And then the physicalist has a nice simple answer. The conscious states are identical to brain processes. And they can say, once you realize that, there's nothing more to explain. I mean, it's like water and H2O. Nobody wants to say, why does H2O give rise to water? It's not like there's some extra explanatory thing here to explain the water just is the H2O. And similarly, the experience of seeing something red just is the, the oscillation in, in uh, V4. And there's nothing more that needs explaining. Now, what causes a lot of confusion here, and it does need to admit it, is that physicalism, the materialist view that the, the conscious states just are the brain states, is highly counterintuitive. It's not easy to believe. I mean, Crick, and, Crick and Cock in their book about materialism call it the astonishing hypothesis, the astonishing fact that, that conscious feelings are just brain states. 
And it's interesting, it's something we might discuss, why is it so difficult to believe materialism? Why is it so difficult to believe that there's nothing more to the mind than just the brain? But that's what I do believe. And uh, uh, once you do believe it, it might be hard to believe, but once you do believe it, then there aren't any problems left. The problems are only generated by the difficulty in coming to believe it. So I put to you that the, the right solution is to come to believe materialism and all your philosophical problems will uh, disappear. And I'll stop talking there. That's it. Uh, all right. I think it was short and crispy and he uh, presented his, uh, his main view. Uh, why physicalism or materialism has become popular for other reasons than mm -hmm. philosophers of mind, uh, you know, thinking that it should be now the fashion. Uh, well, there can be many questions on this and I don't want to waste time uh, uh, in speculating uh, uh, more, but let me have some general for the audience. Uh, you are known for your views uh, for, uh, or a brand of philosophical standpoint called naturalism. Can you please elaborate what it precisely it means beyond the identity theories and other kind of things that we know? How naturalism is different uh, in its uh, flavor? I'm happy to be called a naturalist, but I don't really think of this as a, a doctrine or a set of assumptions or some kind of starting point from which I argue. Uh, I'm in, right, let, 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 me, let me backtrack. I mean, what do people mean by naturalism? It's not very clear what's meant by naturalism. Uh, uh, among contemporary European English speaking philosophers, uh, the, it kind of means something like materialism and, and the idea that philosophy isn't that different from science. So, I mean, there's uh, people sometimes distinguish between ontological naturalism, a view about what's in the world, and then it's a materialist view, and methodological naturalism, a view about how philosophy ought to proceed, and then it's the view that philosophy and science are, are very closely aligned with each other. But as I said, I don't want to think of, of naturalism as a starting point from which I argue, and people might or might not choose to embrace that starting point. I think of it as a conclusion that follows from arguments which everybody will be able to recognize the force of. So, so I just gave you the argument for being an ontological naturalist. And, and if you don't want to be an ontological naturalist, don't tell me I don't share your starting point. Tell me which of my three premises on the original slide you reject. And I put it to you, you'll find it rather hard to reject any of them. So, okay. Um, of course, you reject interactionism uh, very well. And I agree that scientific achievements, particularly in physics and in extensions in biology and neuroscience, should mm -hmm. make all of us confident in that that is all that is which here. And we should not bother ourselves with various other kind of sentences that we keep generating, then it is correct. Uh, many other people uh, are quite convincing. And I would also go back to Hegel, that he civilizational evolutionary states has made, of, made all of us this confident that we should not go back to the old mentality of believing in noise rather than accepting the material world as it is, explaining it with physics. But then, David, there are issues with physics. As you yourself pointed out, classical physics let a lot, lot of loopholes. It kind of drew a circle what it should investigate and left all that it cannot explain. Because I think that is the point of view coming forward and which is energizing these mentalists. They're saying quantum physics allows a lot of this kind of talk because you can explain. We need, we, need, we, need, we need to look at the details. I mean, of course, if somebody is going to reject uh, any of the findings of science and say, look, I don't believe in physics. I don't, I don't believe what, what uh, has been uh, supported by all kinds of uh, experimental evidence. 
then 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 we're going to have to have a different different discussion. But it sounds like you're you're happy to accept uh, uh, modern physics, but are questioning whether it supports the argument. I don't see which bit you think it. I mean, no, uh, the, the, the crucial uh, the crucial premise is is the causal closure of the physical, and I think yes. that's much supported by quantum mechanics as by classical mechanics. Uh, well, I might not have been that well read in physics, but what I keep reading from philosophical speculations on current physics uh, that there is uh, there is a possibility of explaining non-material events. Ah, okay. Uh, and a lot of people are on that, particularly. Uh, so yeah, I don't know whether you would accept that or you you think no, it is you know it's all closed. Okay, and, there's and, there's two there's two common thoughts here. Uh, one is a pretty obvious one, which is that quantum mechanics is indeterministic. I mean, there's debate about how far it's indeterministic, but let, let, let's suppose that it's indeterministic. It's really just a chancy matter whether certain chemical bonds will break or not, uh, whether, whether uh, some chemical reaction will proceed. Entirely chancy. You can have two uh, uh, molecules that are absolutely identical and you can't predict uh, which is going to uh, break and which one isn't it's just you know a 30 chance it's going to happen that's what quantum mechanics tells you and so you might think look look here's some some results the certain certain molecules in your brain uh, split uh where it's a chancy matter according to physics so your separate mind when i thinking of of cartesian interactionism can come down and decide whether the split happens or not and that's that's a natural thought and you, you get people thinking that the indeterminacy of quantum mechanics makes room for an independent mind to interfere in the physical world influence the physical world independently but if you think it's true that doesn't work because while quantum mechanics is deterministic it does say that the prior physical circumstances fix the 30 percent chance for the molecule splitting lays down definite chances and if if an independent mind can come in and make a difference to that chance well then that's inconsistent with quantum mechanics quantum mechanics says uh, there aren't any influences on the chances of physical results apart from the standard force fields the standard hamiltonian operators so uh so the indeterminacy of quantum mechanics really doesn't doesn't help it's a second mm -hmm. thought rather more subtle thought, which is that uh, there's a problem in understanding quantum mechanics, a problem of, of uh, the measurement problem, what happens when the wave packet is supposed to collapse, and one, one but not very popular view of this is that the wave functions collapses when a physical system interacts with a consciousness, and you might think that's a point where the the independent conscious world makes a difference to the physical world. But when you think it through, it's not very, I mean, it's, it's a very eccentric interpretation of quantum mechanics. And what's more, it doesn't look like it gives you what you want because all that happens is that the interaction between a physical system and a conscious mind makes what was previously indeterminate become determinate in a chancy way. And it certainly doesn't look like uh, a good model for an independent mind controlling or directing the physical world. It just makes it the case that uh, uh, this the situation which was previously uh, chancy actually decides to go one way or another. So I really don't think quantum mechanics helps helps here. All right. So uh, David, I will uh, I will now uh, uh, call up and invite uh, Professor Bindu Bamba, a physicist. So he is a, a, a very known professor, theoretical physicist at the University of Hyderabad and uh, a colleague to have a point of view. Uh, Bindu, please go ahead. Uh, very interesting talk, but uh, this idea of materialism and determinism um, uh, is a little bit uh, shaky uh, because um, Penrose has tried to make uh, a model of the 
of intelligence based on quantum mechanics and he reaches the conclusion that ultimately it, it a quantum mechanics is insufficient to uh, to describe uh, intelligence and that um, uh, that uh, artificial intelligence being completely um, uh, uh, you know repro reproduced is not possible because of the uncertainty of quantum mechanics so if it was everything was materialistic and deterministic then uh, building an artificial brain would not be a would not uh, be uh, logically a problem that we just need more uh, technology to do it but it would be possible but however penrose in his many writings mm. says that it may not be possible so what are your views on this um emperor's new mind i'm i'm a huge admirer of of Penrose, thank you for the question. And in particular, I think The Emperor's New Mind is a wonderful book. It's, it's, it's one of the best popular science books that, that's ever been, ever been written. So I'm a big fan of Penrose, but I think he gets uh, eccentric when he comes to these issues of intelligence and quantum mechanics so one one thing he thinks is and it's not big in the emperor's new clothes but in the next book yeah is that Gödel's theorem yes. shows that the human mind is somehow different from a computer yes and this is an old argument goes back to J.R. Lucas an Oxford philosopher and it's Precisely because you do not have a complete set of rules. Well, we could look. We could, we could look into this. It's the idea is that we can show that we're consistent, but a computer couldn't prove its own consistency. And it's not obvious to me that we can prove what. Penrose says computers can't prove. So, so that's one set of arguments. And uh, 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 I mean, I, mean I, don't, I don't want to argue from authority, but 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 the, the philosophers who work on this are not generally convinced by by Penrose. Now, the, the other side of it is, all right, Penrose, what is it about the human? mind brain that enables it to transcend uh, the powers of computers and then he has the funny stuff about uh, microtubules and uh, quantum collapses uh, due to quantum gravity in the brain and I think that's just very hand wavy so I mean this is what I've already said in response to Ramesh that it's all very well saying that something happens, fancy happens involving consciousness, involving the mind brain that causes quantum collapses, but causing quantum collapses is uh, not really a matter of the conscious mind controlling the physical world. Look, here I have uh, uh, a radium atom, uh, the quantum state says it has uh, a 50% chance of decaying in the next while, not such a great example because the while is quite long, but, uh, and now, no, it's a now, so, now, now something happens to make, make this wave function that's kind of uh, 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 spread over the next 1500 years suddenly peak at some point the act of all not, you can't control which point it peaks at you just you, you you just mean all that happens is you make it the case that it collapses uh uh somewhere but you can't control where it collapses you can and, by by proper instrumentation because that's what we do with quantum entanglement states are entangled so something that happens in in uh in uh, uh you know london and something that happens in Hyderabad can be connected because um, you measure it. You know, supposing an atom decays. Into yeah, yeah, but but you can't you can't. I mean, so you can control it that way. But this th that's precisely the point I'm making is why you can't use that kind of of uh, space-like separated uh, 
quantum entanglement to send any signals. Because while you can make it the case that uh, the electron uh, here displays a definite spin in a definite direction and therewith make it the case that the electron in Hyderabad uh, uh, displays a matching spin. I, I can make that, I can make it the case that it has a definite spin and your electron has a definite spin too. But I can't decide what that spin is. That's a chancy matter. So all I can do you know, you measure your spin. I can measure it, right? So, so look, it's like, it's like I've got a coin, right? And it might come down heads or tails. And, and, uh, and if I spin it, it's going to be heads or tails. And now the funny quantum thing is that you've got a coin. And when mine comes down heads or tails, yours magic comes down tails or heads. And we don't know why. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just magic. Uh, but while I can uh, make it, the, I can spin the coin right what i can't do is decide whether it's going to be heads or tails and so all you all you see at your end once you got once you have heads i will have tails according to what no, I, 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 absolutely but i can't control that it be heads and so i can't send a message to you i can't say look when you see tails uh, that means that uh uh i don't know that um Red Rum has won the 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 the, the, the 330 race uh, because I can't control whether you see heads or tails. You're just going to see one or the other, and it's not within my control. So uh, it's not a it's not a good model for the mind controlling the physical world. Uh, yeah. Uh, one more thing about okay. phantom limbs. You know, there is this case about phantom limbs that even when you don't have a limb, you feel the itch. So yeah. isn't that a mind controlling a physical thing? No, I would say that feeling the itch is a matter of uh, events in your sensory cortex. And uh, they're, they're, perfectly okay. well, they're perfectly well there when you have uh, a phantom limb. I, do you think there could be uh, two people whose whose sensory cortexes were exactly the same, whose brains were exactly the same, and yet one felt a phantom limb and the other one didn't? I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. I, there's no evidence. There's no, I mean, I, uh, but it seems to be that some people do feel phantom limb, some people don't, and I don't know whether their sensory cortexes have been, have been shown. Right, but, 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 but it's, it's, it's Somebody who's who's a materialist like me doesn't have a problem in explaining what's going on with phantom limbs. I mean, it's just that uh, because after all, we 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 locate the conscious feelings, we identify conscious feelings with with uh, uh, processes in the brain, and so it could be that somebody with a phantom limb is having just the same processes in their brain as me with my normal limb have, and that's why it feels the same to them. So that that's easy enough for a materialist to to explain. Uh, there. Thank you, Bindu. Uh, in very interesting questions. Oh, all right. Uh, uh, David, uh, many students who, who read up some philosophy of mind uh, books and other, they, they get exposed to all this, both ancient and uh, not many new ideas. But I told you that more recently, many are turning into, turning against materialism of, of, of some sort. So they are approaching for other alternative theories in physics that would support their claims that mental states and minds and all those things are real, just the way anything is real. Yeah. Now, Thomas Nagel happens to be one of the old fashioned uh, philosopher who is still depending on uh, uh, mind and calls for a new scientific revolution as if the old ways won't work for the question of mind. So essentially he's saying that we have to wait and see whether this 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 method uh, would solve this problem or we need a complete overhauling of the philosophy of science even to accommodate mind and you started something of that sort you 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 basically said that it it's fashionable because of certain more other reasons not to, not just simply because we know more about the brain now so well i mean i i must say i don't find uh Nagel's mysterianism very satisfying. I don't see 
that he's offering any any serious alternative to materialism and uh he's just expressing his disinclination to believe it i mean i i don't find that a very uh uh productive philosophical position i mean he he says we can't understand how the mind could be just the brain but i don't see what's the difficulty i mean uh Look, there's an interesting question. Why are people so resistant to this theory that seems to be so powerfully explanatory? But myself, I, I, I don't find the theory uh, lacking. I mean, I say, look, seeing something as red is just a matter of having a brain with a visual cortex, an area V4, oscillations in V4. And you might ask yourself, what would you expect it to feel like to be a being with such a brain? And my feeling is, well, uh, uh, what we've discovered is what it feels like to be a being with such a brain is to have the experience of red. And I don't see that there's any any difficulty there. Let, let me make it. Let me make a an ally. You say that many people now are are becoming unhappy with. Uh, uh, the materialist argument and looking for alternatives. Among the people that debate this within within uh, contemporary uh, 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 philosophy, analytic philosophy, they don't diverge very far from the position I've defended at all. In fact, you won't find people scarcely at all denying the causal closure of the physical. So you think of, of Frank Jackson and David Chalmers, who've uh, two prominent philosophers who are resistant to the identification of the conscious mind with the brain. Uh, originally, they opted for epiphenomenalism because they thought, well, look, clearly, clearly we have the causal closure of the physical. Clearly, we don't want to... Uh, start saying like Descartes that the mind comes in and affects the operation of the brain in the pineal gland or anything like that. So, so they said, well, we've just got to accept that the mind is epiphenomenal. It's uh, there's a brain. It's you know uh, uh, all proceeds according to science. And then in addition, floating above it but making no difference is the conscious mind. Uh, more recently, Chalmers and others have opted for a rather different view, which is the uh, uh, Rossini and Monus view, which sometimes develops into panpsychism. But again, those views are precisely designed to accommodate the causal closure of the physical. They don't suggest that the brain operates in any way differently from the way I described it. And they just want to say, look, the, the material that physics is working with. I mean, they believe physical theories. They believe that everything is made of quarks and so on. And they just want to say that kind of the substance that the physicists are talking about is it self-conscious. And this is, a, as it were, the, the, the materials that physics works with is it self-conscious. But they aren't denying that, that the physics uh, works in just the way that any materialist says. Yeah, uh, David, the problem here is not finding faults with, with neurons or, or brain. The problem is how that can lead to consciousness. Either you accept that themselves are conscious, which is a problem then, because I don't think contemporary neuroscientists can accept that, that, that what they are they're recording is itself conscious, because that, that view is not accommodated in the current materialistic, physicalistic uh, uh, framework. So either so problem is not accepting the brain science. Problem is to connect it to subjectivity that of phenomenality. Okay, more, okay. More uh, clearly, um, we could talk about the the panpsychist Rossini and Monis. I don't take it to be a very substantial difference, and I don't find the difference very very plausible but uh and i think they're kind of motivated by a worry that they shouldn't they shouldn't have okay Let, let's let's let me put it like 
So, so their view is that physics just gives us the structure of reality and, and uh, we have to add something to the physics to give us the substance of reality. So for instance, I mean, just, just take, take uh, go away from the bend, just, just think of, you know, some billiard balls on a table, right? And they'll say, look, physics will, will give you all the laws it fits into. It will tell you that uh, the accelerations are, are inversely proportional to the masses and so on. So it will tell you what masses and forces and accelerations do, but it won't tell you what masses are what it is to be the mass of some object. So we have to add something to the physics. And in our world, there's this, there's this quantity mass that, that plays the mass role. And, and they have in mind, these people, that there's another possible world in which billiard balls work just the same, but, but the mass role there is played by some different thing, some different quantity, smash. Right. And and so they're they're committed to the, 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 the we have all the laws. Physics tells us about all the laws, but which properties fit into those laws? That's something extra to what physics tells us. Now, I think that's pretty weird view. I say that there's another world with the same laws, the same billiard balls. Uh, that's enough enough for the billiard balls to have mass. But but leave it at that. So they they want to to say, well, there's this extra thing. OK. They combine this with a very powerful thought experiment, which is that zombies are possible. So could there be a being who's physically just like you and has no feelings? And uh, a lot of people argue in philosophy that, that that's possible, that that's a real possibility. And therefore, the feelings are extra to the physics. If, if, you know, if there could be a being who's physically just like you, but has no feelings, well, then that shows that materialism is wrong. And I agree. If that's a possibility, well, what, what does that possibility consist of? It, it consists of all the physics being there, but, but the feelings not being there. So as a physicist, I deny that's a possibility. But they say, they say no, 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 that is a possibility. And if you want to understand what that possibility comes from it comes from the possibility that in our world the mass role and so on all the physical roles are played by properties that yield consciousness and in a different world those same physical quantities should be played by quantity played by properties same physical roles played by by quantities that don't yield consciousness and i think that's just uh Yes. If I was convinced, which I'm not, that there's a zombie as possible, there could be a physical being just like me who had no feelings, I would think that surely it ought to be possible even if you have the physical roles played by the properties that play those roles in this world. I don't think that their story is a convincing account of the intuition that zombies are possible. But uh, all right, all right. Yeah. I, I think we, we we have to keep time in mind. Uh, in mind, and uh, there are some questions maybe from the audience. Maybe they can go ahead. I, if you have any questions particular to this discussion, I don't see any hands up. Come on, put your hands uh, up. Yeah, I have a question. Good. So am I audible? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Can you introduce Hi. yourself uh, briefly? It would be helpful. yeah, please. Uh, just give me a minute. Yes. So, uh, so I'm uh, so so my research is in artificial intelligence, and Good. I come from it uh, from a sort of a mathematical perspective. First thing is so uh, so you say the closure of the physical, I mean the realm. Let's say so so first of all, I'm a materialist. So that is not what I'm arguing against. But the question is that. So if we don't know all the physics, how do we know that a closure is possible? Ah. So, I mean, that is the first one. Okay. So the, the so my second question comes from an epi, uh, sort of epic, uh, I mean, from a language perspective from, from let's say Wittgenstein and uh, Quiddell and Turing. 
So, I mean, that is an epistemological issue that uh, there are now, I mean, um, so uh, both, uh, uh, both Gudel and Turing had hypothesized that that language has certain limits, uh, that, that there are certain things that we cannot explain and that is borne out by the mathematical formulation of language. And now that, that may lead us to question that, that, that if we cannot explain everything, can we even explain the mind? So that is the, I mean, the second win argument. So, uh, so, so this does not question materialism, but I just want to put this whole thing into the larger context of our understanding of the world. Good, good. Two, two nice questions and, and connected questions. So the first question was, uh, I guess, look, we don't have a complete physical understanding of the world. I mean, physicists will all agree that there's far more to be known about the physical world. We don't really understand quantum gravity, we don't really understand, uh, is space-time real or does it emerge from some more basic string theory metaphysics? So, I mean, you know, th th there's lots to be discovered in physics. So if that's so, how do we know that uh, the causal closure of the physical is true, that every physical effect has a physical cause? My answer to that is, look, we could know some things about the physical truth without knowing everything about the physical truth. And in particular, it seems to me that we already have good evidence. Look, we're going to, we're going to discover other things in physics that we don't yet know. We, we might even discover some, some forces, some extra forces that we don't know about. Uh, uh, and uh, understand better how, how, nuclear forces work. Maybe we'll discover that there's, there's more, more there than we thought. But the question you have to ask yourself is, do you think that we'll discover that there are specifically mental forces, forces that arrive just in connection with the, uh, the brains of sentient organisms, and that that's, that's a point on which physics is going to turn out to be deficient. And it seems to me we already have enough evidence to know that that's not the case. We have enough evidence about the workings of uh, the cells inside, inside brains to, to conclude that we aren't going to find any special forces that operate specifically inside brains. So that, that was a question about the causal closure of the fit. I mean, I mean, you can put it like this. I mean, what an effect I've suggested is that we have enough evidence for the causal closure of the non-mental. Hmm. That that uh, if you think of physical as whatever was not mental, uh, then that's causally close. We aren't going to discover that that you need specifically mental forces to account for what goes on. So that was the first question. Second question was about the limits of language. Uh, is science going to be able to account for everything? Yeah, perhaps not. Perhaps not. Or rather uh, than we may but, be able but, to but why shouldn't we be able to account for some things, and in particular, account for enough things to tell us that the mind just must be just the brain? But then that leaves an epsilon out that, that that certain epsilon we cannot really explain. I mean, a small amount that we cannot really explain that may always be true. So what what is it that you, you can put your finger on that we we can't explain in connection? Currently, for example, the the hard problem of consciousness we cannot really explain right now uh, from from a purely physical i mean point of view well and i just sorry, i i i i i'm not sure perhaps i could have made it clear my view of the hard problem of consciousness is that there's nothing there it's just an expression of the intuitive attraction of dualism that when people go on about the hard problem of consciousness, they haven't yet embraced physicalism. I mean, all they're pointing to is the difficulty of believing physicalism. What they aren't pointing to is any problem that remains after you've come to believe physicalism. But, sir, you said belief, but so are we supposed to believe or are we supposed to understand? 
that should we understand the consciousness? I mean, you're, okay, you're saying that we should believe it, but there's no explanation. So why should we believe it? Uh, well, what's to understand? Uh, look, let me give you. I say ident identities need no explaining. When, when, let me tell you an, an old story about Ned Block uses this to illustrate the point identities need no explaining. He uh, says, imagine that there's two groups of historians. One of them studies Mark Twain, the author of Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer and so on. And the other studies Samuel Clements, who was a, a, a well-known citizen and a businessman and used to be a river pilot and so on. And then one day at the History uh, Association conference late at night in the bar, they're next to each other at different tables and they hear each other talking and they discover that, that they've been the stu studying the same person, that... that, that Amazingly, Samuel Clements and Mark Twain are the same person. And at that point, they ask themselves, you know, why, did the, why did it take us so long to figure this out? Why, why, uh, why uh, did uh, this person adopt two different distinct personae? But what they won't ask is, why was Mark Twain Samuel Clements? They won't ask for an explanation of identity. Once you recognize that that, that, that this was one person everywhere that Mark Twain was, Samuel Clements was, they're in the same places, same town, same, the one person, you don't ask, why are they one person? And similarly, I say, look, we discover that, that uh, neural oscillations in V4 and seeing something as red, they happen at the same time, they happen in the same people, they happen, they have the same causes, they have the same effects, we should just conclude they're the same thing. And at that point, there's nothing more to understand. I mean, there's one thing there. What's to understand? Uh, so when you say you want to understand why the brain processes go with the conscious feelings, you're asking for an explanation of why two different things happen to happen, happen to, to be correlated so well. But once you accept they're the same thing, that question goes away. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to say we need to understand. I'm just saying that in this case, uh, we've got understanding. There's nothing more to understand. Okay, uh, we need to uh, sort of, we are coming to the end of this fascinating exchange. Any other one or two questions by the audience? I, I had yeah. a question. Um, so Ma, what I want to ask is also related to what you just said about identities not needing explanations. Well, um, yeah. So one of the arguments against the whole uh, water is nothing but H2O, that, that argument with identity theories is that, um, let's say there was somebody who had never seen water, who never knew anything about water, and you explain everything about the chemistry of water, what is H2O, what is H, and what is oxygen, and how it combines, and all of that. Even if you explain everything about it, that person will still not know what water is. Right. So even, even if we agree that water is indeed H2O and that it can be reduced to H2O, there is something about the property of water that is maybe not reducible to H2O. I think this is also similar to the Jackson's Mary uh, argument, the knowledge argument. Um, yeah. So I, I think this is, I think it's a form of property dualism, what I'm talking about, that, that maybe they're reducible to each other, but they have distinct properties which still mean something in, in some sense? I'm, it's a nice question. And uh, there's various technical issues here, but I think the short thing I'd say is look, and this, this is what one says about the Mary argument as well. We should recognize that there's two different ways of thinking about this thing. So we can think of it as everyday people do in terms of uh, there's a liquid, it's odorless, colorless, and so on. We've got a kind of everyday notion of, of, of water. And then we can think of it like the chemist does, who maybe, maybe doesn't have the everyday notion. They just think of uh, 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 the kinds of bonding you get with the uh, constitution of H2O and how you get a certain kind of laminas and viscosity and so on. 
so there's two different ways of thinking, but it's not obvious that that corresponds to two different things in reality. It might be that we have two different concepts and they refer to the same thing. And uh, I've already mentioned my friend Tim Crane once uh, in this talk. He 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 says says that's what philosophers philosophers they they really like that he says two concepts one thing they really like that uh and so there's a lot of a lot of cases in philosophy we we, we talk about uh, the co-reference of two distinct concepts it doesn't mean there's two distinct things in reality now it sounds like you 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 know this area well and and one might say look don't we have to uh, recognize that there's different properties associated with different concepts in order to understand how they're different and, and so the argument can go on but at first pass i'd say look all you've pointed me to is 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 two different concepts and they may well still refer to the same thing all right uh any one more question maybe uh, we will mm -hmm. Okay, so I think uh, most questions that people may have had were already answered, or such questions were raised. And we did have a, a good uh, conversation. I think David certainly defends his materialism with all the jest, and uh, that actually is not very disbelievable. It is what it is. The problem yeah. is the incorrigibility in us that we still think that there has to be something else and that incorrigibility is probably evolutionary and we can't get out of that so easily so we have to wait and watch so uh, even the, you know the, the conceivability argument that you can conceive of a zombie who is such is itself the, the problem because you can conceive of things then you want to analyze and explain them within the current structure and then then you invite more problems so we can conceive of such things uh, easily and then we want to explain them. And this is what I think some, some authors, they, they exemplify when they, the conceivability argument. I uh, wanted The to conceivability, we, we should have been talking about. I, I, I uh, didn't know we had all these uh, uh, philosophy in the background. But when, when I talked about zombies, I talked about the possibility of zombies. Possibility of zombies is a problem for a physicalist. The conceivability of zombies is no problem at all. I mean, you've got to get from the conceivability to the possibility. Look, somebody might say it's conceivable that water not be H2O. It's conceivable that water be made of uh, some continuous medium or that it's been made of some funny uh, alien structure X, Y, Z. Uh, and so chemistry is wrong. And I say, no, no, in fact, it's conceivable doesn't, doesn't mean that it's false. Uh, 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 you can't disprove chemistry that easily. So you need something more than the conceivability of the alternative. I mean, it's conceivable and physics and chemistry has shown that it's conceivable, but false. Uh, so, uh, of course, we can conceive of zombies. The question is really, do we have to, I mean, when we talk about the possibility of zombies, that's just, just a way of talking about uh, the conscious feelings are different from the brain states. Uh, and that's what the materialists won't, won't, won't admit. My last question, do, do, do materialists like thought experiments? Uh, very interesting question. Uh, uh, I like thought experiments as a way of clarifying what the issues are. I think thought experiments, not just in philosophy, but also in science. I mean, think of you know Galileo and uh, uh, tying the two balls together, or or Einstein, and we we're talking earlier about about EPR correlations. Uh, terribly important for making us get all our assumptions on the table. We can see what we're presupposing, but I don't think of thought experiments as a distinct. I mean. Uh, intuitions about thought experiments as a distinct kind of evidence and, uh, yeah. and, and simply in science. I mean, Galileo made a thought experiment where his intuitions uh, were a guide to reality, but, but what showed that they were right is, is, is what actually happens when you tie two balls together and drop them. And Einstein's intuitions uh, were in fact wrong about reality, 
but they were terribly important because his thought experiment made us lay out those intuitions and showed Bell how to construct his argument for Bell's inequality. And I think similarly in philosophy, we, we needed thought experiments to make us articulate our assumptions, but our intuitions about the situation shouldn't carry any weight in philosophy. That's my view. Yeah, uh, I, I often tend to think that all the philosophical uh, discussions and uh, questions about the mind and brain are fine as, as a disciplinary activity, but they have ramifications for other people who are fighting their own struggles. For example, mm -hmm. now if you take a very hardcore materialist view, a biological, physical view of a person, but then the human cry now on identities and seeking various uh, justices and the way people think they are. Now, material, materialism cannot explain all of that, that thing because it has limitations. Uh, it cannot convince them, although it can tell them who they are actually, but it cannot convince them why this would not be otherwise. The question of gender. So there are broad questions which social scientists and other people that keep writing about. So once we uh, sort of, you know, we present them this, this nice view of the brain and, and biology and perfectly yeah. holistic, they, they say that, well, I, I tend to think differently about all of this. So, uh, the... so we're not coming on to questions of, you know, politics and value and morality, but I, I, don't, I don't think naturalism should be excluded from uh, thinking about these things. I think naturalist accounts of these things are are the right ones and uh and what's alternative suppose that the morality is is laid down by some higher authority who who rightly dictates laws that we ought to follow uh i i don't think that that's a better way of thinking about morality than the the, the approaches you get out of naturalism and naturalists have lots of things to say about, about morality i mean i i'm in fact a a, a believer in uh objective morality and I think they're real moral facts and uh, I think a naturalist can give perfectly good accounts of that. Oh, so I think we should uh, keep it at that and you may be getting your timers. Yeah. All right, so I think David, uh, we cannot be more thankful for, for your accepting the invitation and the, 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 uh, the energetic uh, deliberations that we have out. And I think many, many of us will benefit from uh, Although we will battle with these ideas for time to come, but I think there will be some sort of a, a solution. Uh, of that would be agreeable to most of us. Uh, depends on how much we know physics or how much we know about the brain or not. Not certainly all of us are that well educated on, on the technical side of things. But yeah, but I, I, I thought this was, was a very, very good and wide ranging discussion. And thanks, thank, thank you. you. All the questions to everybody. That was that was excellent. That was fun. Are you writing any new book that we look forward to? I am. I am. But I'm. I'm. So, so my last slide. I I, I did a book a, a year ago, which uh, I thought, how can I illustrate the last slide? I'll put my last book on metaphysics of sensory experience, which is more more naturalism. And the cover uh, uh, was. Uh, The cover is a detail from a painting by my daughter, who's an artist. So that's that's oh, my daughter's excellent. painting. So that's my last book. But but now I'm working on something, nothing to do with uh, uh, the mind. I'm working on causation and causal inference. And uh, how do epidemiologists get causal conclusions out of purely observational correlational data? And uh, that's a, a longstanding project of mine. So that's what I'm working excellent. on. Very good. All right. So I think uh, we will thank you. And I thank the audience. I thank uh, the students, Vaisnavi particularly, who has been very active and helpful in organizing this. And uh, I also thank those who attended and asked questions. And this will be put up as a video on the uh, university's uh, official website for others to uh, look at it when they have time and come back to David if they have questions. Is the type is name, it's there. It's not difficult to find him on the web, on the, on the, on the internet. I think that uh, it has created this, the spirit of thinking and thinking more differently and reading more of it. And I think we all should be happy about that. So thank you, David. Uh, and I thank everyone. And please uh, be alert about the, our new episode that we will uh, keep doing with other prominent figures in times to come. Uh, join us uh, and look for it. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you.
Thank you very much for inviting me. I enjoyed that a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye now. Bye. Bye.